Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone. Thanks for joining us here on Tax and Development Days uh, to kick off the first uh, one of the first sessions. And um, I'm Andrew Auerbach. I'm a senior tax advisor in the global relations and development part of our Center for Tax Policy and uh, chiefly uh, responsible for assisting developing countries with the implementation of our international tax standards, including the two pillar solution as it, as it develops here. So the, the focus of today's session is going to be on um, uh, the economic impact and understanding a little bit the numbers uh, behind the two pillar solution. But um, I wanted to give you a, a brief overview before turning to, to other colleagues uh, to hear the details of that, uh, give you a brief overview of where we are and what the two pillars solution uh, is about. So if we could go to the, I guess, slide three there. Um, just while we're waiting for the slide, I mean, the, the idea... Uh, sorry, Andrew, sorry yes. to... Uh, uh, Heike, uh, your screen is not in full screen sharing. So I think that's why we cannot see the the slides uh, going down. Okay. Well. Okay. While well, we resolve that, uh, I think uh, the 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 general um, approach of the two pillar solution is to try and and resolve and and update the international tax rules uh, that have uh, presided for you know the better part of the last hundred years and to try and modernize the system and, and in doing so stabilize it. Because if you look at large multinational enterprises and looking at the map here, uh, a company in, in country A may be doing all sorts, having all sorts of activity uh, across many, many jurisdictions. There's only four here, but uh, a big company uh, may have operations in over 100, 150 jurisdictions. And the existing international tax rules simply um, don't work uh, as they were intended in respect of a lot uh, of the income that's earned. Uh, in particular, the lack of a need for a physical presence in any of these jurisdictions in order to earn income, uh, which had been the hallmark of the old economy, but is no longer really um, particularly, uh, you know, a requirement uh, in, in, in the digitalized economy, means that the countries where M&Es earn a lot of their profits don't have a right to tax that profit. And that's, um, and that's problematic because uh, they quite rightly look at the, at the large profits that, that M&Es are earning, saying that we should have a, our, our fair share of that. Uh, at the same time, uh, a lot of the, the digitalization and the, the reliance on things like intellectual property um, the reliance on intangibles, uh, the importance of data, means that um, a, a profit can be shifted quite easily and, um, and means of production uh, relocated around the globe very, very easily. And uh, such that the profit is often earned in low tax jurisdictions. So you see in the diagram here, country E is the, is the place where the quote unquote residual profits are, are earned. Next slide, please. So the idea behind the two pillar solution is to address these two problems. The one problem or the problem on the one hand is that the existing rules for allocating taxing rights between jurisdictions no longer work properly. And so amount A of pillar one is the, is the attempt to reallocate taxing rights. Uh, to give more taxing rights to the market jurisdictions. Amount B is about uh, ensuring that uh, the existing rules work as intended. And so transfer pricing, if, if you're familiar with the ability of companies to shift profit through uh, the way they price their intercompany transactions, uh, which allows them to put more or less profit or more or less loss uh, where uh, where they wish it to be for tax purposes uh, is a big strain on uh, on the tax system and generates a lot of disputes. Amount B would bring a formulaic approach to that, which would be a lot easier for low capacity countries in particular to apply and and to ensure they're 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 not losing their their right to tax income. 
pillar two, um, even if all those things work, pillar two provides a global minimum tax of 15%. And, and that's really quite extraordinary. Uh, it means that no matter what kinds of tax planning, um, tax planning efforts companies, uh, companies undertake, the, the low tax profit for the larger M&Es will always be subject to at least 15% uh, corporate uh, effective tax rate. Uh, there will be some uh, accommodation made for substantial activities, so investments in real businesses. Um, but uh, generally speaking, the race to the bottom and the competition between uh, jurisdictions to offer low tax rates in order to attract investment uh, will, be, uh, will be set at a floor of 15%. And it, allow, it will allow uh, countries to get rid of wasteful uh, tax incentives. Um, finally, the subject to tax rule means that developing countries, which have given up sometimes the right to tax, um, uh, base eroding payments like interest, like royalties, uh, which are often used by multinational enterprises to shift their profit from a high tax country to a low tax country, uh, will be subject to, again, at least a minimal rate of tax. And, and that's for the benefit of developing countries to ensure uh, their, their tax base is protected. Um, next slide, please. Um, so where are we now? Uh, this this work comes from the the October 21 political agreement uh, that was agreed by almost 140 uh, jurisdictions, members of the inclusive framework. It was a, a fairly short document, a few pages long, that really set out the parameters for a deal. And what we've been doing since October 2021, what the OECD has been doing, is working with its entire membership to develop the rules and the international instruments uh, necessary to bring the two-pillar solution into legal effect. So for pillar one, um, many of what we call the building blocks of the agreement are, um, are very well advanced. Um, there, there has been extensive public consultation uh, on all aspects of the two-pillar solution, including amount A. And, and we've just recently uh, sent out a public consultation document for amount B. So there's a lot of work going on there. The idea is to finalize um, the multilateral convention to give effect to the reallocation of taxing rights by middle of 2023. Uh, so we're quite... Um, we're, we're, we're up against that deadline, which is a few months away, but we're working very hard to do that. A big part of that, uh, of, of that work has been the economic impact assessment because it allows countries to understand um, the, the, the impact of the deal and, and, and how different aspects of the deal um, will affect uh, the, 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 the financial bottom line for them at the end of the day. Uh, next slide, please. Now, importantly, pillar two um, is, is uh, rather than, um, whereas amount A and amount B are, are works in progress, the globe minimum tax rules have been agreed. And so right now what we're doing is working on parts of the implementation package. Uh, and indeed, uh, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, countries are working towards implementation, which I, I think I have on the next slide. But right now, what we're doing uh, through the working parties and the membership of the inclusive framework is working on how the implementation can be consistent um, and the administration of it uh, can, be, uh, can be coherent. So uh, we've released a number of things in that regard. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes, this shows you where inclusive framework members are taking steps towards implementation of the global minimum tax. Um, and indeed, uh, the European Union has set a directive that will take effect on 1 January 2024, but a lot of other countries, um, and you see on the list there uh, around the world, are making taking steps, taking concrete legislative steps towards implementing the, the global minimum tax. So this is happening. And the way uh, that it operates in practice, um, as, uh, as soon as you have a large enough contingent of multinationals that are subject to it, 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 it tends to spread across the entire globe. And um, jurisdictions will be very rightly need to assess the impact on, on their own 
uh, taxpayers and where they have opportunities to pick up some of the money that's available. We estimate that there's 220 billion annually, but I'm going to leave it to Pierce and um, and others to 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 take you into the numbers. I think that's it for me. I'm not sure if there's a next slide or not. Um, and I will turn it over to um, to Laura Stefanelli, uh, one of my colleagues, who will uh, give you a brief uh, highlight of. Um, uh, the capacity building programs. I see a hand up. I think maybe we let, um, uh, let's let Laura uh, provide an, an overview and then we'll turn it to Pierce and, and our colleagues from the IMF. Okay, thank you, Andrew, and uh, welcome to everybody. And uh, as Andrew said, I'm Laura Stefanelli and I work in the Global Relations and Development Division. I'm going to provide you very, very quick with a very quick update on the current uh, capacity building activities uh, that at the OECD we are in conjunction and also in cooperation with the international organizations and the regional tax organization we carry out to support countries, uh, especially. Um, developing countries in the implementation of the measure. Here in the first, in these slides, you can see the, um, the range of uh, uh, capacity building activities. Uh, on the left, we have, uh, I mean, some activities and some programs specifically dedicated to inclusive framework members. Um, and here we have induction programs that we started since the beginning uh, of uh, uh, the inclusive framework when it was first uh, uh, established in 2016. We have now new pilot program specifically targeted to the implementation of the two pillar solutions, so pilot programs on pillar two and tax incentives. We are going to discuss a little bit uh, uh, more, I mean, the next slides, the pre-meetings, technical session, regional consultations. We also have bilateral, we provide bilateral support uh, to developing countries, uh, both IF and non-IF members. And uh, these are mainly um, targeted to tax, um, ta transfer pricing issues and tax treaty, but also now, I mean, the, um, the uh, implementation of the two pillar solution is also part of these programs. We generally carry out this program in, co in uh, collaboration with um, ATAF and the World Bank. We have a specific a couple of slides on the global relations programs, uh, and uh, here is about the trainings and the resources, all the uh, e-learning e e um, modules available to tax officials. And also, we have tax inspector without board borders programs. Then now, I mean, initially also were targeted to, to transfer pricing, but now I mean they are expanding into new areas, including the two pillars and tax incentives and this is the program for the next couple of years um, next slide please um, the outreach to developing countries, as I, won, I was mentioning before, um, is mainly, um, I mean, so, I mean, over the last couple of years, uh, uh, it, several rounds of regional consultations. We started the regional consultations in 2021. Last year, only last year, we carried out 14 events in five regions. Again, these regional consultations are in cooperation with the regional tax organizations. Uh, almost 2,000 participants from um, more uh, than 145 countries and jurisdictions attending this consultation. And this is a heads up because the next round of regional consultation <coughs> will likely be carried out in April, May this year and it will be targeted and focusing on the MLC, so the Multilateral Convention for the Implementation of the Pillar uh, 1, Amount A, and the signature that is envisaged in uh, um, early uh, July, so in uh, um, before the summer. Also, um, we carried out some technical sessions at the end of last year and the beginning of this year on key aspects of uh, pillar, uh, pillar 1. And as, I mean, we have some, I mean, events that are more, I mean, general, and provide an, uh, an overview. I mean, these technical briefings for, especially for developing countries, so I mean, a specific focus on uh, topics like the, um, the uh, elimination of double taxations and also the marketing and distribution safe harbor. And also, I mean, we are carrying out briefing session, uh, so pre-meeting and briefing session before and after key meetings of the steering group of the inclusive framework, the task force on the digital economy and, uh, and other key meetings also the plenary, the inclusive framework on BEPS. Uh, we 
had, I mean, two days ago, an inform a webinar for all inclusive framework members uh, um, talking about uh, on, I mean, on, on the two pillar solution and where we stand. And these two days are also part of the outreach to developing countries. Next slide, please. Here we have, as I was mentioning before, the global relations programs, and we had, I mean, pre-recorded 11 webinars on the two-pillar solution. And I mean, these are accessible to all tax officials from tax administrations and uh, Ministry of Finance. And also, I mean, we have also some capsules, I mean, with a general overview on the two-pillar. I'm not going to list, but these are accessible on the KSP, the knowledge sharing uh, platform. And also, I mean, there is a link to all the webinar that are you know, accessible. And, you know, of course, I mean, tax officials can uh, watch and listen to this webinar at their own pace. Next slide, please. Finally, I mean, the global relations programs also includes live training. We have webinar uh, planned from March until November on, and also, I mean, these are pre-recorded webinars, but there are also some um, Q and A session on recorded webinar where I mean, tax officials can interact with the experts and they can post all the questions that they have. And you can find the calendar and information available on the uh, Global Relation Program website. Uh, that is, all the links will be accessible also uh, in these slides. And I think uh, this is the update on my sign. Back to you, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. I think we're going to move uh, immediately to uh, to the meat of the session, which is really to dig into the numbers. So we have Pierce O'Reilly. He's head of the Business and International Taxes Unit uh, here at the Center for Tax Policy at the OECD. Uh, he'll start, and then we have colleagues from the uh, from the International Monetary Fund. We have Alex Klama, Division Chief, and and Christoph uh, Wertzegger's uh, Senior Counsel at the IMF. So we'll hear from them. So. Without further ado, uh, Pierce, take it away. Oh, I, and just one thing, I see a couple of hands. We'll have some time at the end for questions. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So Pierce, the floor is yours. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, nice to be able to talk to you all and, and talk a little bit about the uh, what we estimate to be the impact of this two-pillar solution that Andrew and Laura have been uh, discussing. So I'll provide uh, an update on our work to try and model the revenue impacts of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Um, and then I'll, I'll pass to the IMF, who will give, I think, a, a, you know, a broader perspective on, on the international tax debate, into, including the, uh, the, the two-pillar solution. So turning just to the, the, the revenue estimates and, and the work that we've done, we have been working for, for years now, really since the beginning of the, the, the work on the two-pillar solution, to try to help IF member jurisdictions understand the economic impact and really you know a key goal of that work is to try to level the playing field uh, across all IF member jurisdictions so that all member jurisdictions have access to the same information and, and can really make informed choices and participate in the design and the debate with the right information that can can help them uh, you know uh, make the decisions that they need to make in terms of the design of these uh, these two pillars. So as part of that work, we released in October 2020 uh, a report um, examining the impacts of the two-pillar solution. You know, that that was then, and the, the, the work on the design of the two pillars has continued to the intervening period. We have continued to work as well. The, because the design has changed, we have updated uh, our analysis as well. So, so I'll show you now uh, in this presentation some updated figures on what the impact of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 will be on, on tax revenues. Overall, the results suggest that uh, there will be additional revenue gains for both pillars um, relative to our previous estimates. And I'll try and explain a little bit um, why that is. If we could go to the next slide, please. I mean, really, the, the, the changes in the revenue estimates come from, from three main places. First of all, um, you know, the design of both pillars have changed and has changed in ways that deliver additional revenue. Um, second, you know, the quality of our work has improved. We have better data than we had uh, previously, so we understand better the location of multinationals' activity. You know, how much low tax profit is there out in the world? Where might this profit go, et cetera, et cetera? And we've, you know, we've improved. Uh, we've improved the modeling. So, so that's that's why we have uh, additional revenues relative to our, our previous estimates. But I'll go through these design changes in a bit more detail in a few slides. 
Um, this presentation uh, will focus on revenue, but it's really important to say that, I mean, the benefits of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 as well extend well beyond revenue. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's important not to be too narrow in terms of why we're doing this and what these two pillars deliver. Um, you know, the broader benefits of these pillars include tax certainty, tax stability, avoiding you know a, a more chaotic international tax system characterized by unilateral measures and more tax tax disputes and, and even you know potential uh, trade disputes that would all be burdensome on on growth and, and and investment and so really you know we we believe these two pillars will deliver revenue but more broadly than that we also believe that they will deliver a tax environment that is you know, more conducive to uh, investment and growth so turning then to the next slide and focusing in a little bit more on some of the key design changes that have been agreed as part of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 that I think are particularly relevant for developing countries. So these um, five five design provisions, and you know, it's not an exhaustive list of of the important uh, features in Pillar One and Pillar Two that we've tried to model, but these in, specifically are important for developing countries, and I think they're worth highlighting because they do matter in terms of the revenue gains for developing countries for Pillar One and Pillar Two. So, so just to focus in on these one at a time, um, under Pillar One, um, you know, in in the period since the the uh, original Pillar One blueprint, um, developing countries, uh, you know, argued for and secured special nexus thresholds, um, which means that amount A. Um, will be provided at a lower a lower threshold for smaller jurisdictions, meaning that smaller jurisdictions will have to have less sales in their jurisdiction to start to receive their revenue under amount A. So this is a specific targeted measure towards small jurisdictions to make sure that they don't lose out on amount A. Next is what we refer to as tail end revenue provisions. So the revenue sourcing rules in amount A ask MEs to try to find out exactly where their consumers are in order to understand where amount A of Pillar 1 is, is going to go. So amount A reallocates taxing rights towards market jurisdictions, reallocates taxing rights towards where sales are. But what MNEs have told us is that they don't necessarily have complete visibility over where all their sales are. And so there's a rule in the in the amount A design that says like, okay, well, if you don't know exactly where all of your sales are, you can take a small pocket of your sales where you don't know exactly where they go and you can ring fence them for low and lower middle income countries. So what this does is it provides a, you know, a pocket of tax revenue that, that it can be allocated exclusively towards low and, and lower middle income countries that, that leads to additional revenue gains for them relative to what we previously looked at and relative to, I think, what is what is well understood in the public debate. Next, there are de minimis rules um, in terms of the elimination of double taxation. So amount A is, is this movement of taxing rights from jurisdictions where profits are today to jurisdictions where sales are. And what the de minimis rules do is they, they, they ensure that small jurisdictions and you know, usually lower income jurisdictions will not have to surrender uh, taxing rights as part of that process. The surrender of taxing rights will, will come more from higher profitability jurisdictions, um, higher income jurisdictions, larger jurisdictions. They're the ones who will essentially have to pay for this new taxing right because of these de minimis rules. Under Pillar 2, then, there is a revised allocation key under the UTPR, the, the under tax payment rule, that, that includes employees, which will ensure that their additional taxing rights will be allocated to, to low income jurisdictions relative to, to what we've previously modeled. And then also there's this qualified domestic minimum top of tax that Andrew previously mentioned, which is really an opportunity for source jurisdictions to really tax first uh, low tax profit uh, arising in their jurisdictions. So these are just some of the design features that we've we've tried to model. If we could just go to the next slide. We've tried to model you know, the, the two pillars in as much detail as possible. And as you can see from the previous slide, you know, these various design features can seem a little bit uh, complex and esoteric, but they do matter for the, the revenue gains for different jurisdictions and for developing countries in, in particular. So trying to get as detailed quality modeling of the actual revenue impacts is really important in order to understand who's gaining revenues from, from Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. So if we just go to the next slide. So I'll just give a high level picture on what, what Pillar 1 looks like, what Amante looks like. 
So amount A is a reallocation of taxing rights from jurisdictions that have residual profits, jurisdictions that have high profits, to jurisdictions where sales are. And you know, a, an important question there is, well, how much profit is going to be reallocated? And you know, the design of amount A is that it's residual profit of very large firms. So it's the profit of the largest and most profitable firms in the world. And what you can see in this chart is really just a sense of how much profit and how many firms are in scope of amount A. And here you see this over time from 2016 to 2021. And in the red line, you can just see that the number of firms in scope of amount A is rising over time. And in the blue line, you can see that the amount of profit in scope is also rising over time. So, you know, uh, amount A, uh, we estimate is, you know, started off at around 100 billion when we first did this work. And we estimate that it's in, in the latest available data to us, it's about 200 billion. So it's doubled in size approximately in the last five years while we've been doing this impact assessment. And so that just goes to show, I mean, the, the, the more M&Es will come in scope of amount A over time. Moreover, um, we expect that you know the largest MEs in the world are going to you know um, remain profitable, and that's going to see additional revenue inside the, the pot of reallocated taxing rights, and that's going to be important for revenue gains for 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 everyone. Turning then to the next slide, so this slide really just shows our um, revenue estimates for three key categories of jurisdictions, high income jurisdictions, middle income jurisdictions and low income jurisdictions. And each bar there is really just a, a given year in our data set. And so what I've what I showed you before is that, you know, amount A is kind of rising in size over time. And you can see that reflected in the results. So these are expressed as a share of CIT. And you can see that as a share of CIT for each jurisdiction group, high income jurisdictions, middle income jurisdictions and low income jurisdictions, we find that the revenue gains rise over time as a share of CIT. What do we also find in this chart? Well, you can see that low income jurisdictions typically have higher revenue gains as a share of CIT than high income jurisdictions. And you might think that this is surprising because, you know, uh, people say that low income jurisdictions haven't done well from the reform or that, you know, low income jurisdictions aren't getting a lot of taxing rights. And of course, low income jurisdictions are small in size in, in terms of GDP or market share. But in terms of the amount of amount A that's being allocated to them as a share of, compared to what they have now and compared to the amount of corporate income tax that they're, they're gaining today, low income jurisdictions do slightly better in our model. And why is that? Well, that's that's basically because they receive taxing rights because they have sales in their jurisdictions, but they tend not to surrender any taxing rights because uh, of the various design features that I've talked about. And then also because typically there aren't these residual profits, these very, very high profits in low income jurisdictions. So low income jurisdictions are receiving taxing rights, but they tend not to give any taxing rights away. And that results in then these higher revenue gains as a share of their current taxing rights that, that we see that they get relative to high income jurisdictions uh, in, 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 uh, in our analysis. And we think then that this is driven then by these design features that I mentioned, such as these de minimis rules, the lower nexus threshold, the special tail end revenue provisions, these, these specific features, design features um, that have really been kind of carefully negotiated, they do benefit uh, low and middle income countries uh, in important ways. So just turning to the next slide. So this go, goes into the, these, these provisions that I mentioned previously in a little bit more detail. So what we've done here is we've tried to get a sense of, well, how much would low, low and middle income countries gain from pillar one with and without just illustratively, these uh, design features that I previously mentioned. So that's uh, an elimination uh, de minimis. That means that um, low, low, smaller jurisdictions will be less likely to give away any taxing rights. Another de minimis that protects uh, smaller jurisdictions from the marketing and distribution safe harbor, which can reduce your amount A. This tail end revenue provision that ring fences a certain amount of taxing rights for low and smaller income countries. The special nexus threshold that, again, for smaller jurisdictions um, will, will make it easier for them to get amount A. And using uh, macro keys in the revenue sourcing rules, which, again, is a way to, to look through to final consumers, which is another way that, uh, that uh, revenue will, will be secured for, for smaller jurisdictions. 
And what we basically have done is that we've rewon the model with each of these features, adding them into the model one at a time. So you can try and see the, 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 the impact of each of these features um, on the overall revenue estimate. And basically what you can see just, you know, if we, if we were to take out all of these features from the model, we would find that low, low and middle income jurisdictions would gain about 1% of CIT, a little bit less. And then when you add in all of these features, essentially the, the, the share of CIT that they would gain would be about twice that, about 1.6, 1 1.7% 1 of CIT. So obviously this, this isn't a, a very, very large amount of, amount of additional revenue. Amount A is modest in size. But uh, you know, over the period of the last two years of negotiations of Pillar 1, while these features have been added into the mix, um, you know, they do represent additional um, revenue gains for low and middle income countries that, that essentially double their revenue gains relative to a scenario where these features are not included. And so we think that there's, there's a certain amount of value in terms of trying to do a model that, that really tries to take account in as much detail as possible for all of these, these specific features because they do matter. So that um, uh, concludes most of my um, presentation for the day. I will uh, just briefly mention one additional study that is not our work, if we could go to the next slide, but I do think it's, it's important, especially from a developing country perspective. This is a report commissioned by the African Union that compares amount A revenue to the revenue from digital services taxes. And we know for developing countries, you know, there, there is this debate about it, the merits of, of pillar one versus digital services tax. I mean, the view in the OECD and it's certainly uh, the view of the impact assessment work is that you know DSTs are quite burdensome economically. Um, they can result in in tax and trade disputes that can be quite bad for growth and investment and can hold back growth. You know we think they're kind of qu can be quite challenging to administer, um, and we tend to think that they're just a less beneficial option for a whole variety of reasons relative to pillar one. But what's an ad interesting additional insight from the African Union study that you know is that there are potentially additional revenue gains um, from Pillar One relative to SDST. So specifically, the study found that uh, uh, implementation of Amount A would gain about twice the revenues for just for African Union members was the the studies the countries they studied, but about twice the revenues from Pillar One relative to a two percent DST. So we think that that's an interesting, important finding that, that we hadn't seen previously uh, in the debate. So I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions at the at the end of the session. But I'll, I'll turn now, I think, to back back to Andrew maybe to, uh, to yeah, continue. Yeah, the thanks, thanks, Pierce. Now, there have been some questions in the um, in the chat that that we've answered. If you could have a look at those as well while uh, while the IMF is presenting, uh, grateful for your your insights there as well. Um, I want to turn now to the IMF. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, we have Alex uh, Clem and Christoph uh, Verzigers. I'm not sure how you want to uh, divide your time, but please go ahead. You have uh, you have 15 minutes, and then we'll get uh, to some interventions. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and for your introduction. Um, I'm going to start this uh, presentation here. Um, first, just to mention that the IMF is not a standard setter in this area but we have been working and we are working hard on the topic. It's part of our surveillance of our capacity development and of our analytical work. And in terms of analytical work here, you can see a book that we have published two years ago, but today's presentation is going to be about the latest board paper that we published just in February, just very recently, uh, which assesses the reform um, it updates on other ongoing reforms. It, it discusses policy implications for members. By members, I mean IMF members. Um, and it uh, points to future international reform directions. Next slide, please. And immediately the next slide, please. Um, so um, this table uses evaluation crit criteria that we had developed already in 2019 in a previous board paper uh, to assess uh, the reform. Now, I don't have time to go through every cell in this table, just to say overall that, uh, of course, a summary assessment like that has to be treated with some caution. Uh, but the clear message from it is that uh, the IF reforms are a major improvement over the current system. So if you look at the colors, everything turns from red towards green. Um, so um, maybe I mentioned just uh, one issue that sometimes is brought up in questions. Uh, so I bring it up preemptively. Some people ask, why is pillar one practically not easier than the current system? And here the answer is because it doesn't remove the current system, right? The current system still applies. Pillar one is a system that applies on top of this. 
So it has all sorts of advantages, but it is not more easy to implement practically. Um, the table also compares the reforms to the more pure reforms like full residual profit allocation or full minimum taxation without any um, substance-based income exclusion and so on. And if you do this comparison, sometimes these pure reforms, they look better, but we are totally aware that they are not always politically possible. So the key message from this figure really is that the reform proposals are an improvement over the status quo. Next slide, please. I will now present some quantitative findings. Uh, they are also all subject to uncertainties um, because some of the details of the reform are not finalized, although a lot of progress has been made recently. And uh, we don't always have all the data. We need to make a proper assessment. Um, but with these caveats in mind, you can see here that according to our estimates, also there are uh, revenue gains from both pillars. Um, if you want to compare them to the figures that uh, Piers just presented, actually they are pretty similar. And given that this is an area where you cannot obtain very precise estimates, actually the differences are very small. Uh, so we similarly see an increase in pillar one revenues for almost every countries except for these investment hubs, which might lose out. Pillar two in our estimate has a greater impact uh, than pillar one. Um, and that is especially the case once you take um, dynamic effects from uh, higher tax rates as a result of reduced tax competition into account. Uh, so this is something that will hopefully come over time as a result of this uh, reform. Next slide, please. So uh, for developing countries, two aspects are of particular interest. So under pillar one, in addition uh, to uh, the um, amount A, there's also this proposal to simplify taxing distribution and margins, uh, amount B, which also has already been described today. Um, so here, uh, the details are under discussion, but a lot of progress has recently been made. And uh, this is certainly something that is of utmost importance to developing countries. Uh, it's also maybe useful to note that developing countries will lose from the abolition of the digital service taxes under pillar one. But according to our estimates, the digital service taxes, they raise extremely little revenue. So this is a very a small amount. The other important aspect that we discuss in the paper is the additional source taxation that developing countries get under the subject to tax rule. So that rule, that rate of course is, is lower at 9%. Uh, but, and the important point is it credits existing withholding taxes as well as any additional taxation in the residence country. And as a result, based on our estimation, very few treaties around 100 are affected and the revenue impact from that is uh, very small. Um, yeah, I see it's already on the next slide. So here, this is uh, investment. Investment is not expected uh, to decline very much. So we cite a couple of studies. I'm not going to go much into this. Just to point out, obviously investment declines when you raise taxes, it's kind of unavoidable but we don't believe that the effects are going to be very large or that this is a major problem, especially because given that everybody participates, FDI cannot easily uh, move away to other countries as is currently the case and as in the, is the case for studies that are being made using uh, current data. The paper also has some estimates of effective tax rates, but I don't have time for those here. So let me come now to profit shifting. So a welcome effect of the reform is that also profit shifting is likely to be reduced. And we can estimate this by looking at the smaller differences in tax rates between countries because the lower bound is gonna be 15 rather than 0%. And you can see from that, that all countries are expected to gain revenues from this reduced profit shifting, again, with the exception of certain low tax jurisdictions. With that, I would like to pass on to my colleague, Christoph Werzegers. Thanks. Alex, and, and good morning, everyone. I, I will say a few things first about administrative complexity. So we look in the paper also at administrative complexity that we assess will likely be quite high from implementation of the agreement, particular areas that we identify are uh, rules for relieving double taxation on the pillar one, for instance, of course, the subs sequential application of various uh, minimum tax rules. Uh, on inbound and outbound uh, flows are also likely to raise complexity. Um, and of course, these rules require close uh, coordination between uh, countries, 
as they need uh, domestic uh, law implementation with potential for variation, potential mismatches. Uh, so, so, so this needs uh, attention, uh, of course, as well. Um, finally, on this slide, to say that, um, uh, of course, ex existing uh, exchange of information networks already cause problems for developing countries, so more work will be needed in that area as well. Um, moving to the next uh, slide, let's talk a little bit about uh, country reform priorities. So next slide, please. Um, regarding Specifically regarding Pillar 1, of course, in principle, countries who have agreed to the um, uh, agreement uh, basically have uh, no choice. In effect, when there is critical mass, the system will enter into effect. On Pillar 2, of course, it's different. Countries have to make strategic choices uh, other than, of course, having to accept application by others. Um, and, and so we look a little bit more into Pillar 2 uh, stance, what countries should, should or should not do. Uh, First point to make here, of course, is that it's important that uh, for the um, reforms to, to, to have the maximum effect, it's important that the largest number of large economies uh, adopt minimum taxes for the system uh, to work uh, properly. Secondly, of course, once that happens, capital importing countries will have a, a strong incentive to adopt a QDMTT or qualified domestic minimum top up tax. Um, such tax would have uh, the potential to raise raise revenue uh, with effectively no no downside as it will only apply uh, when uh, the ME would have to pay tax anyway, uh, except it would then pay it in the source and not in the resident or other countries. Uh, as we discuss also in the paper, um, raising revenue through a QDMTT dominates other forms uh, of, of tax increases because of the way QDMTT would be credited. Um, there are, as Alex said, of course, types of country that would uh, lose out on, on revenue, uh, and that would be the conduit countries that we've already mentioned. Um, and of course, countries without uh, large m &Es would probably not be affected at all. Um, beyond those immediate uh, uh, points, of course, uh, countries should consider broader tax reforms as well. Uh, and of course, uh, one point that's been mentioned by others as well is, of course, the re reviewing uh, tax incentive uh, systems. Uh, there are some issues, for instance, with stabilization clauses, but given that com country companies in scope are likely to uh, face higher taxes somewhere, um, uh, we believe that this is a problem that should be capable of being uh, resolved. Um, where tax incentives are important enough to be kept, they should probably be redesigned or, or to make sure that they interact properly with uh, the Pillar 2 rules, in particular tax credit uh, uh, frameworks, uh, for instance, that work through timing or uh, that are uh, designed to be refundable. Um, and of course, countries can also uh, choose to, to, to increase tax rates uh, because of reduced tax competition pressures uh, that can be uh, effective uh, as well. Finally, uh, we also believe that there's still a role for, for broader minimum tax frameworks also at the domestic level, considering that they can, to the extent that they interact properly with uh, QDMTT and the agreement. What, one broader point that we make in the paper also is to look at the broader um, revenue uh, needs for developing countries. So, of course, uh, as we mentioned, the reform is very welcome. It raises additional revenue. We think this is, of course, very welcome for countries, but the developing country revenue needs are much uh, higher uh, when we consider, for instance, uh, the needs under the sustainable development goals. So the paper gives a bit of overview there as well in terms of uh, what would what would increasing tax capacity mean? What would bringing re uh, developing countries up to the level of emerging markets, for instance, mean for for um, uh, for revenue uh, collection. Uh, a final word, and I'll, I'll stop on that, is the, the penultimate slide, which where we look a little bit into the future um, and, um, and and uh, point towards what, 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 what the directions uh, for future reform could be. So one broad direction here, of course, is movement towards more destination-based taxation um, um, that are more, uh, of course, robust to tax competition and profit shifting. Um, we spoke in 2019 a lot about DBCFTs, destination-based cash flow taxes, of course, not currently on the agenda, uh, but there are aspects, of course, uh, of destination basing already through pillar, pillar one, including using sales factor formula, which, which has, um, has potential for future um, uh, strengthening. Uh, another uh, point, of course, is that the agreement over time could be broadened by lowering uh, thresholds or removing them all 
uh, together, such as the substance-based income exclusion. Um, the slide that Alex showed uh, shows uh, you know, the important revenue uh, potential of removing uh, that carve-out and would also, of course, remove the, the incentive of moving real investment into uh, low-tax jurisdictions. Finally, um, of course, we, we uh, as Alex also pointed out, we see uh, great potential from things like amount B and the SDTR, uh, which uh, we think could be further strengthened to benefit uh, the developing countries as well. Um, and, and finally, maybe one point to make is that we, we, we believe that um, developing countries could also continue to consider uh, other uh, limitations on base rolling payments uh, as they already do in relation to interest. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll stop there. This is just a summary slide of the points we made throughout the presentation. Um, so uh, thanks uh, for, for giving us the opportunity uh, to present. And, and, and of course, we'll stick around in case there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, really appreciate uh, your taking the time and, and, and Alex as well. And, and of course, the messages, which are very positive. And, and, and thank you for underlining uh, Amount B and, and the STTR, which get a little bit less press, I think, than, than other parts of the two-pillar solution, but, but could really um, really contribute to, to important gains uh, for, for low-capacity countries. Um, I think we're going to have take a couple. I saw some hands before. I think I know that uh, if Lee Quirk is on the line, I know that uh, uh, ATAF, the African Tax Administration Forum, had had some points they wanted to they wanted to make. And, and there are some questions in the chat which we're we're, we're we're attempting to answer. But if you do have a question you want to pose to uh, one of the intervenants here, please uh, please raise your hand. If uh, Lee is here, I would uh, I would go to uh, to you for the moment, though. But thanks very much, Andre, and um, good afternoon and good morning to everyone, depending on where you are. And and, and thanks very much to to Pierce and, and colleagues from the IMF for those very interesting um, presentations. And it was it's in, for us it's extremely interesting to see some of the commonalities um, in the uh, outcomes that you see uh, forecasted from these. Um, estimates that you've made. You know, I, I think we're aware that for many of our members, um, the first question that they will get asked um, if there is um, a need to sign and ratify an amount MLC will be, um, well, what's the tax impact of signing and ratifying this multilateral convention? Um, so I think this type of work, looking at the numbers is, um, Going to be extremely important in that work and and as you say as i heard pierce said you know interesting to see the report by the african union and you know obviously from our perspective we're interested in the position for african countries so seeing that report and seeing in particular what they say about a two percent dst and um, compared to amount a and the amount a is likely to yield around double the tax um, and that doesn't take into account the design features etc and that have been developed um, subsequently uh, we think that's very important uh, also very encouraged to hear um, hear you say that um, the design features that uh, we as ATAF and, and many of our members fought hard for um, such as the special nexus threshold etc and um, make such a big difference i.e nearly appears to be nearly doubling um, the share of CIT um, from 0.87%, I think you said, to 1.66%. So, so that's uh, really encouraging to hear. And, and then I think the point about um, the STTR is important to us. We, we think um, the subject to tax rule under pillar two is extremely important. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that develops because uh, I, I think I read in the IMF report actually that. Um, you see most of the withholding tax impact being on services. So the scope of the STTR on services looks like it will be a very important issue here. And um, so that was very helpful. Uh, and um, we also see the uh, qualifying domestic minimum top-up tax as perhaps the main um, revenue driver um, for African countries, many of whom had numerous uh, tax incentives that 
appear rather excessive. Um, so we think that that is going to be a bit of a game changer. Uh, and we're working very closely with our members to really encourage them to look at implementing a QMDT in um, line with when countries start introducing an income inclusion rule. And um, so we, we see that as a very important part of this work. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lee. Um, we, we had uh, we had a question in the uh, in the chat, um, which I'm, I'm trying to answer. If there are any other hands, though, please, please raise them. Um, indeed, uh, one of the things that's been mentioned both by peers, by the IMF and, and you know, Lee's, Lee's uh, highlighted as well as the potential uh, gains uh, for Pillar 2 and the global minimum tax and uh, the next session will deal specifically uh, with um, with uh, tax incentives and how the global minimum tax will interact with them and what we're doing to support a country. So I invite you to stick around uh, for that as well. In the meantime, so we've had um, we've had a, uh, a question, a very technical question under Pili 2 in the case of a holding company consolidating line by line several listed multinational groups owning economical stakes in the range of 30%. Who will be accountable slash considered UPE for Pillar 2 reporting? And, and, and I guess my answer is you, you've asked a very trick, tricky technical question um, that the general test for the ultimate parent entity is whether or not it consolidates with the, uh, with the, with the subsidiaries. I, I think your, your, your suggested figure of 30% might be a little low from my understanding, but regardless, um, there will always uh, be a question when that holding uh, stake is less than 100% how to account for those minority interests or other non-controlling interests uh, in, in those entities that are subject to the global rules. Very, uh, very complex question. Uh, I, I, would, I would direct you first to the, to the, to the rules and the commentary. And there's also uh, illustrative uh, examples that, um, uh, that we've published that, that, that may, um, uh, may, uh, may go to that. Um, And I think the, the other question from Sylvia Velarde is the OECD has estimates the impact of Pillar 2 on tax incentives at, at the global and regional level. And I think we're still, I speak under the control of Pierce here, but, but we're still kind of trying to account for low tax income um, and the, uh, the, uh, the impact of the global rules on, uh, on, on individual countries, uh, particularly where they have, they, they may have high statutory tax rates, but they have pockets of low tax income. Uh, I don't know, Pierce, if you're still online, would you like to um, uh, maybe just say a little bit about what we've done sure. about the P2 numbers at the global and regional level? It's Yeah, th thanks, Andrew, and, and thanks for the question. It's an important one. Um, so I think we completely agree with the, the comments made by the IMF that, you know, Pillar 2 probably weighs, raises uh, quite a bit more tax revenue compared to Pillar 1. Um, what we think, what we have tried to uh, account for previously is it's low tax profit and low tax jurisdictions. So where jurisdictions have, you know, no corporate tax or a very, very low corporate tax rate, we've tried to, to look at that and, and see what the impact of the 15% minimum tax is likely to be. Um, but of course, we also know, uh, like I think some people have said in the in the chat, that you know many high tax countries, countries with high statutory tax rates, may have some low tax profit as well, and that can be because they have tax holidays, tax exemptions, other ta kinds of tax incentives that may mean e even if the average tax rate is high, there may still be some low tax profit therein. Um, and for those countries, looking at uh, a QDMTT. Or, or tax incentive reform can be an important an important revenue raiser, um, and that can can lead to a, you know additional tax revenue over and above what's in in our estimate or the estimate of uh, of others. Thank you, thank you, Pierce. Uh, there, there's one more question I think we want to get to, and then we're going to have to to close. Uh, we have from uh, Jose Galindez uh, asks: uh, We currently benefit from tax incentives that are offered under statute or have been guaranteed by particular tax authorities. 
can we still benefit from these? And, and, and the question to that is, well, what is the reaction or response of the government uh, in light of, um, of the global or worldwide implementation of, of the minimum tax? So in a given country, um, you know, if, for example, there's a tax holiday uh, or a tax-free zone where, where companies operating there uh, benefit from, uh, let's say, zero tax, uh, whereas the, the statutory rate is, is 25 or more, uh, or in any event, more than, than 15. Well, do they still benefit? Well, it depends what the company, what, what the country does. And, 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 and the point, you know, what, what, what's really important to understand here is that if that M&E or if that company is in scope of the globe rules somewhere in the world, either in the ultimate parent entity jurisdiction or some intermediate entity jurisdiction, uh, if the globe rules are applying somewhere, and of course, because we have, you know, the European Union moving, because we have, uh, you know, Korea, Japan, uh, Singapore, et cetera, a lot of countries moving, then, then, then companies will be that are, that are that meet the, the the size threshold will generally be in scope of these rules. So, it might be that in that country there's no tax because that's what the statute says, uh, but it's going to be taxed somewhere. And so that company will pay 15% tax in respect of that income. And now the question for the country is, well, what do we do? Because that you know, offering 0% in that case is not attracting investment because that, in, that, 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 that profit will be taxed anyway at 15%. And so it, tend, it has the, the, the effect of raising um, the, uh, the, the floor on tax competition to 15%. So what is the, what is the reaction of the company or, or of the country? Um, and that's what we're working on. Again, the next session deals with the impact of the tax incentives on uh, the interaction with the globe rules and, and what countries should do as a result. Now, the other part of your question, and I have just one minute here, uh, I think is, uh, you know, or have been guaranteed by particular tax authorities. And I guess, you know, the question there is, are there fiscal stabilization clauses or other, uh, other agreements that have promised a lower tax rate? And I think uh, it was Christoph from the IMF that, that alluded to this, that uh, generally speaking, um, we're, we're hoping that's not a significant problem because again, companies will have to pay this tax one way or the other, as long as they're in scope of the rules. So I think we're, we've hit our, our, our time limit. I, I want to thank uh, all the uh, people who joined uh, today and, um, and uh, also for the intervenants from Laura and, and Pierce and, and Alex and, and Christoph, uh, as well as Lee and the others who asked questions. Uh, so I'm sorry if we didn't get to everything, but I, I think we're going to have to call this a session. And I think, as as was mentioned, uh, the, the the recordings and the, and the slides will be made will be made available. So uh, thank you very much, and please do stick around for uh, for the other uh, sessions on tax and development days.